Great, thank you, Brenda. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun uh, series for me to do, and I hope it's been enjoyable for you as well. I, I'd like to thank the, the good folks at the Poultry Innovation Partnership for uh, continuing to invite me back to, to speak. Uh, when I started this series, we were really talking, well, we, obviously we started at the beginning, um, and I tried to stress the importance of when you place a pullet flock or when you're looking at, at buying in pullets, um, really the work has to start when those birds are day old and, and even before that with preparation, but um, we cannot just think about success in the layer barn from the standpoint of what happens when those birds are moved into the layer barn. Uh, we have to start at the very beginning and we have to think about our goals for the end of production. Where do we want to be at the end of production? How are we going to get there? Now, I realize we're going to be talking about uh, the end of production. Um, so maybe starting with the end in mind is not appropriate. Let's say finish with the end in mind. So we've done all this work. We've done all these good things in terms of managing and feeding and, and paying attention to the details. Um, now we want to reap the benefits and make maintain good quality eggs, uh, maintain high production and maintain bird health all the way through the end. Uh, so I've, I've put this slide up several times uh, over the, the last few set, uh, well, last few webinars. Um, and so we, we talked about the pullet stage, we talked about transition delay, we talked about peak production and shortly thereafter. And today we're going to talk about finishing strong. So how do we uh, make sure that the, the cumulative effects of a long duration of egg production um, how do we make sure that those, those effects are, are minimized? How do we make sure that we continue to give the hens what they need in terms of meeting our production goals for them? So I just want to review what we talked about before, because everything that I talked about today really is going to be based on the assumption that we've done a good job um, with all these things, managing the birds, feeding the birds, paying attention to the details all the way from day zero uh, up to peak production and beyond, and now uh, looking towards the end of the production cycle. So pullet rearing key points, um, managing body weight and composition, uh, making sure the birds are um, in good condition. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we weigh the birds frequently. We, we use flushing, so we, we feel how well the birds uh, are, are putting on uh, body protein reserves. And we want to do that frequently because small frequent changes are the most effective way to get the birds to where we want them to be if they're starting to diverge from our chosen path. Um, we want to encourage feed intake, nutrient intake. Um, we may uh, include a fiber source to increase gut capacity, and, and we may also want to train the birds to eat more frequent meals. And then really important, if the birds are underweight, that's not the end of the world, particularly if we make appropriate changes. So we can delay changing to the next dietary phase. Typically, that means the birds will be on a higher nutrient density feed for a little bit longer, gives them more opportunity to gain body weight and, and body condition. Uh, we want to manage stress, whether that's vaccination um, or other stressors. And we can go back to an earlier dietary phase if the birds are stressed and, and the feed intake isn't what we, what we want. Again, that higher nutrient density earlier diet is going to give the birds uh, a greater opportunity to catch up. Um, and of course, if the birds are still underweight at the time we would normally want to photostimulate, we can still delay photostimulation because in the long run, and particularly if we're using longer and longer production cycles, we will gain those lost eggs at the front end. We will more than gain them back uh, over the productive cycle of the bird. Uh, and then uniformity, of course, is ideal. We want, we want every single bird in that flock to have exactly the same nutrient requirements. Now there is biological variability, but we wanna minimize that because it will make it much easier to manage those birds. Uh, when we talk about transition from pullet to mature hen, uh, we want to continue with the end in mind uh, and remember that we're going to make decisions that uh, lead to success in the long term and not just trying to minimize our short term costs. And I, I encourage you to think of the pullet as an investment in future egg production and therefore an investment in your long term profit. Keep weighing, keep flushing the birds, um, delay photostimulation if the target weight and the composition is not achieved. Um, and that estrogen surge that takes place that brings the birds into sexual maturity depends on body composition and age. And we're going to talk a little bit about that estrogen surge later on in this, this talk. 
We also want to make sure that those birds have sufficient time to deposit medullary bone before their first egg, because this medullary bone is going to be the bone calcium reserve that's intended to use to support eggshell formation. And we're going to talk about medullary bone uh, as well. Uh, and then our last webinar, we talked about feeding to peak and, and, and post peak. Um, and again, assuming we start with a uniform flock through pullet management and nutrition is going to make this uh, high producing phase where honestly a lot of our money is made, um, it's going to, to optimize uh, that. We can manage egg size. Uh, we talked about how um, small hens, birds that are small coming into production will lay smaller eggs throughout the production cycle. Um, and so depending on your strategy for egg size, um, that, can, that can be effectively used. However, the risk is that those smaller birds will have inadequate nutrient reserves and nutrient intake. And there's a danger that they will actually come out of production, not necessarily a full molt, but they will come out of production and um, they, will, they will have a difficulty achieving peak and maintaining that, maintaining good persistency. Uh, and so we would need to remember when we're feeding these birds, particularly around peak and beyond, uh, that nutrient requirements are largely dictated by egg production, well, by egg mass, average daily egg mass, which is not just the percent hen day production or hen house production. It's not just the average weight of eggs, but it's the product of those two things. Percent production times average egg weight uh, divided by 100 is the um, average daily egg mass. And so we feed according to the nutrient requirements. So I told you all that. So I can tell you this, where are we at? Well, we're, we're somewhere post peak. Um, I, I didn't put a strict definition on the timing, but uh, if you look at this graph, we've already sort of covered the pullet phase. We've covered the, the start of production and, and peak production. And now we're gonna hopefully achieve good persistency in egg production through the end of the uh, production cycle. So uh, this is um, an interesting graph. If we were to look at a similar graph from a management guide, uh, from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we'd see uh, a, a couple of different things. So I just want to take a moment and, and consider where are we? Where are the birds? What has genetic selection done um, for uh, the egg industry? And as a consequence, what has selection done to or for the birds? Well, around the world, we're seeing a trend towards much longer egg production cycles. And honestly, uh, the modern genetics are capable of sustaining those long production cycles. And uh, you may have heard my, my graduate student, uh, Nella Batras, talk about the potential for, uh, for long production cycles in Canada. I think it's a really interesting prospect, and I think that um, it's probably something that the industry uh, could, could really profit from uh, moving forward. Be that as it may, if we look globally, uh, the egg production cycles are much longer uh, than they, they used to be. So um, this graph shows um, in 100 weeks, uh, or at 100 weeks of age, um, modern genetics are capable of laying 500 eggs per bird. Um, and even for a, a longer than typical for Canada cycle, um, if we keep the birds to 80 weeks of age, a good producing flock will only produce 360 eggs. So that's a lot of extra eggs produced per hen. And if we think about the stresses and the nutrients that are required to support those long egg production cycles to get an extra 140 eggs per hen, um, we need to, to think about uh, how, how can we achieve that? Well, part of it is genetics. And so uh, this is comparing um, the characteristics of a 1980 egg flock, egg production flock, versus a 2020 flock. So um, I'll just point out that the lines that end at, at uh, it's around 70 or 71 weeks of age, uh, this is the 1980 flock, and you see a couple of things. First of all, uh, they reach a peak production a little bit later, they reach a lower peak production than current, and persistency is not as great. And so uh, the, they lose egg production much more quickly after peak than the modern birds. The second thing, and, and this is really important in terms of the ability of the birds to be able to handle those long production cycles. And that's this, uh, this egg size line. And so the egg size line increases and increases and increases. And at a certain point, the eggs become so large, uh, it's difficult for those hens to, to put a good shell on it. 
Uh, and so we run into a lot of problems with cracks, with oversized eggs, uh, eggs not fitting into flats and, and uh, just all sorts of problems. Now, there are really two things, well, two things that I'd like to focus on right now that has allowed for longer production. Now, I recognize in Canada, we don't keep birds up to 100 weeks currently, um, but we still have the same genetics and we still have the same uh, characteristics that we need to be aware of, uh, but also that we can take advantage of. And the first one of those is that persistency. So uh, this top line is a 2020 flock. You can see they reach peak production at a younger age. Uh, they maintain persistency for much longer. So even at 100 weeks of age, uh, those birds it typically are laying at between 65 and 70 percent production. Now, really, what's allowed for uh, the birds to stay in production and be profitable is this egg weight line. So this lowest line here that extends all the way to the right of the graph, um, you see that the geneticists have selected for birds that have a very slow increase in average egg size. And what that means is that those eggs don't become, or in general, there's always things that we can do wrong, uh, they don't reach that um, really large egg size with really poor shell quality um, until, until much later. So even though the eggs are not as big, usually one of the limiting factors that uh, would cause a modern commercial flock to be depopulated uh, is shell quality rather than uh, egg size or, or percent production. Okay, so I talked about this in a previous webinar. I just want to remind you that um, if we look at egg production, so these values are simply taken from a, a primary breeder management guide. Uh, if we look at egg production, we've got a peak uh, reached at 34 to 36 weeks of age, good persistency. Uh, we have um, an egg size in the blue line in the middle here, uh, which slowly increases. Um, to about uh, 66 grams at 95 weeks of age. But the nutrient requirements of those birds are going to be the combination, the product of those two, percent production times average egg size. Uh, and we can see that peak egg mass is reached at around 60 weeks of age, or sorry, excuse me, at around 45 to 47 weeks of age. And really, because egg, average daily egg mass drives most of the nutrient requirements of the birds, this is where we typically reach. Uh, peak nutrient intake or, or peak nutrient need for those birds. So just a reminder, body mass contributes uh, and the maintenance requirements for that body mass contribute to, uh, to the overall nutrient requirements of the birds. Um, remember that if you've got extensively housed birds that are a lot more active, uh, nutrients in particular energy requirements are going to be higher. Uh, so if you're transitioning from cage production to uh, loose housing, that's something that you need to keep in mind. Remember to monitor average daily egg mass because in addition to body maintenance, this is going to be the biggest driver of nutrient intake. Now what we see is, if I just go back to this slide, uh, is as average daily egg mass decreases, nutrient requirements also decrease. And so if we look uh, at feeding recommendations, we usually see um, both a slightly reduced feed intake uh, post peak to the end of the cycle, um, which includes a decreased energy intake, decreased amino acid levels and, and phosphorus, available phosphorus, uh, and an increase in calcium. Now that's a, that's a nice stepping off point to talk about how do we manage these birds uh, from post peak to the end of a production cycle, however long that is. And, and I'd, I'd like to focus on this increase in calcium. Um, it's, it's tempting to say that, well, as the birds get bigger and as the birds, um, as, as the birds uh, are laying larger eggs towards the end of production, um, shell quality might start to suffer. And so the obvious thing is that we just increase calcium. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to recommend, well, I don't have the data currently, we're working on it, um, to uh, to counter what the management guide says about uh, the rate and extent of increasing in, cal uh, increase in calcium as the birds get older. But I will point that if you're tempted to try and solve uh, a, an eggshell problem, one of the things that we see in the, in the physiology of the bird is that as we increase the amount of dietary calcium, so we increase the calcium in the feed, uh, 
generally the birds become less efficient at retaining that calcium. So at, at low levels of calcium, um, the birds are very efficient. Now, the absolute amount of calcium present, even with that efficient absorption, might not be sufficient. Uh, if we go at the very high extreme, um, the birds are simply not going to absorb much of the calcium, or if they do absorb it, uh, it's more than they can physiologically use, even if shell quality is limiting, uh, and so they excrete it. So yes, calcium is very important for shell quality. If you're feeding a deficient level of calcium, that is likely going to increase shell quality. However, there are other causes to shell quality problems, and adding more calcium doesn't guarantee that you'll see better uh, shells. Okay, so I wanna transition from shell quality and we'll come back and talk about shell quality uh, a little bit, but I wanna talk about the laying hen skeleton because the laying hen skeleton really is an important driver uh, or contributor to shell quality. Now, we, we're talking about the end of the production cycle. Uh, and so if we look at the skeleton of uh, a laying hen, uh, in this case, we've got uh, humeri. So this is the upper wing bone uh, of, of a, a hen. Uh, at 15 weeks of age, these are x-rays. Uh, so there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of bone material to block the x-rays going through the tissue. And so we see these bright images here because a lot of the x-rays are being blocked by bone material. Good bone quality, good bone density. These birds are 15 weeks of age. Um, it says laying hens, these are, are actually pullets. So they haven't started to lay eggs, they've got good quality bones. By 70 weeks of age, you can see there's a lot of bone depletion. Um, and so uh, what happens over time is there's a gradual loss of structural bone. Uh, from the same study, same age birds, 70 weeks of age, you'll see one of the birds actually has quite good bone quality. This bird has probably gone through a molt. So she's got good quality. Uh, the implications are that she has gone through a molt, she's gone out of production for a period of time, you're still feeding that bird, she's not producing eggs until she comes back into production. So why does that happen? Well, let's take a look at bone development in, um, in laying hens from zero days of age, so uh, a zero day old pullet, uh, through an 80 week uh, production cycle. Okay, so as the pullet is growing, as the body is getting bigger, she's depositing more structural bone. Um, and in the immature bird, estrogen levels are low. And so when the bird approaches sexual maturity, estrogen levels spike. So that's that surge in estrogen that, that accompanies sexual maturity. And at that point, that increase in estrogen causes uh, the structural bone deposition to stop. And instead, the bird deposits medullary bone. Medullary bone is intended as the sort of calcium bank account to support eggshell formation at night when the birds are not consuming feed, but when most of the eggshell formation takes place. Now, if we go through uh, uh, the production cycle, estrogen levels remain high. Uh, if the estrogen levels drop too low, the bird simply comes out of production, and this is uh, associated with a molt. Now, birds remain in production, but over time, there's a loss of structural bone. So even though there's medullary bone present, even though medullary bone is continually deposited and, and mobilized, but redeposited, um, even though we see perhaps even an increase in medullary bone, over time, we see a decrease in structural bone. And if we're not careful, we will see a, a precipitous drop, a, a huge drop in structural bone integrity and this can lead to problems with, with bone breaks, um, whether uh, in, in wings or legs. Uh, if, if the break is in the, the spine, uh, it can lead to paralysis. So these are they're serious uh, issues. So I, I just wanna show you what this looks like. So um, at, at 16 weeks of age, this is a bird that is sexually immature. We know this because there is no ovary development. And you can see there's good cortical bone. So the, the cortical bone is this outer shell. Uh, we can see some nice strong bone struts. And these are, are trabecular bones uh, called trabecular bone. They uh, allow the skeleton to be very strong yet very light. Uh, and we don't see any medullary bone in this immature bird. With the onset of sexual maturity, the birds start to deposit medullary bone. And by the time they lay their first egg, we can see that she's still got 
pretty good, solid, uh, thick cortical structures. We can see some trabecular bone struts here, and this is probably a trabecular bone strut here. Um, but this really dark blue staining material around the periphery is medullary bone. And so it's deposited on the surfaces of the structural bone initially uh, when it's deposited. Now, when we uh, look at a bird at 67 weeks of age, we see that the cortical shell is very, very thin. Uh, we can maybe see some very thin trabecular struts here and here. Um, and so there's a real loss of structural integrity in this bone. Now, there is lots of um, medullary bone here. You can maybe see it, there are these little tiny dark specks. So, so rather than these more discrete um, bits of medullary bone at first egg, uh, the medullary bone is there, but it's very, very diffuse. Uh, if we look at the amount of medullary bone, there's probably more medullary bone present in this sample, uh, in this bird at 67 weeks than in this bird at 20 weeks. Now, fortuitously, uh, I received an email from one of my former uh, graduate students. Some of you may remember Kuni Pongani. Uh, Kuni is now in Thailand. Uh, he's uh, uh, working at Kassetsart University. Um, and he sent me some pictures from an experiment that they just finished um, looking at long production cycles. So this is a, a bone from a 100 week old hen. And you can see that the cortex, the structural bone is very, very thin. Uh, and in the middle uh, is medullary bone. Now this bone has been ashed, meaning it's been put in a, a uh, furnace for probably 24 hours uh, or six, 16 to 24 hours uh, at 500 to 600 degrees Celsius. All of the organic matter has been burned off. And so all of this material is bone material. So this medullary bone, you can see it's structurally different. It's quite spongy, it's quite porous, um, and doesn't contribute much to the strength. Okay, so that's one of the things that I want to, to remind you is that often by the end of these long production cycles, the uh, structural bone reserves are very minimal, even though there's a massive presence of medullary bone. Okay, we'll talk about why that is uh, in a moment. Okay, so what are the consequences? Um, well, it, that weakness of the structural bone tissues can lead to bone fractures. So essentially what it is, uh, is an osteoporosis in laying hens because they've lost structural bone mass. Um, there can be bone breaks during production. Uh, healing can occur. This is a, a humerus from uh, a bird in one of our experiments. You can see that the bone has broken um, and has subsequently healed. Uh, that is a, a stress on the bird. The bird probably went out of production. Um, and even a good manager may miss things like this because chickens are prey species. They learn to hide weakness. Um, and so it's instinctive for them to, uh, if they possibly can, to not show injury. Uh, makes them more susceptible to predators. Uh, breaks can also uh, happen during depopulation. So whether the break occurs and heals, uh, that is a stress for the bird. Uh, breaks during uh, depopulation can also be a welfare concern for, uh, for the industry. And of course, it can also lead to production losses. So if that bird is, is busy healing a bone, uh, the stress has probably taken it out of production. And so, of course, we want to minimize stress and maximize production. Uh, in cage-free systems, one of the ways that this is shown is through keel bone breaks. And so, um, in addition to high levels of production, um, putting a strain on bone mineralization, um, we see that uh, birds in extensive housing or cage-free housing are more susceptible to cage breaks. Uh, let's face it, laying hens are not what we would call graceful flyers. Uh, and in an extensive housing situation, they basically have the opportunity to gain more momentum and potentially uh, to have more impact when they land on a perch or if, they, um, uh, if they, they don't really have a controlled landing. So um, this, this is a big concern, not only in caged birds, you know, we always used to talk about cage layer fatigue, um, but structural weakness in the skeleton can also be a problem for uh, extensively housed birds. Okay, so I pointed out that um, at the end of the production cycle, the, the hen may have lots of medullary bone and still have weak 
bone structure. Um, when I first started working with poultry, I think the, the perception was that the problem with caged layer fatigue uh, osteoporosis was that the birds used up all their medullary bone and then they simply had no choice but to uh, mobilize structural bone and uh, that was the cause of cage layer fatigue. Well, the pictures that I've shown you, uh, I hopefully will convince you that osteoporosis bone weakness happens in spite of a lot of medullary bone being present. So why does the hen mobilize structural bone when there's lots of medullary bone present? Well, let's look at how that happens, how the mobilization of bone to support eggshell formation takes happen. I'm, I'm giving a bit of a teaser here. We'll talk about uh, the use of bone calcium to support eggshell formation in a, in a couple of slides. Okay, so this is a, a micrograph. So this is a microscope slide of uh, laying hen bone. And I'll point out some structures here. So on the left-hand side of the, the image, we have cortical bone. So this is structural bone. These dark blue staining um, sort of islands in the, in the image are bits of medullary bone. Now, when there's a high demand for calcium, per, uh, as we would see during the night when a hen is forming an eggshell and there may not be calcium coming from the gut, she mobilizes bone calcium. And the bone cells that mobilize calcium from bone tissue are called osteoclasts. And these osteoclasts simply work by they're up against the bone surface. That's what they mobilize. They, it's a little more complicated than this, but basically they reset, release an acid solution that mobilizes the, the bone tissue and that released calcium is taken to the blood and the blood takes it to the shell gland. So we see uh, osteoclasts here mobilizing medullary bone. Well, the problem is osteoclasts are not specific to medullary bone. So when an osteoclast finds itself in contact with a structural bone surface like we have here, that osteoclast is going to mobilize structural bone. Now remember I said when, when estrogen levels are high, when the hen is in production, she stops depositing structural bone. She can redeposit medullary bone, but she stops depositing structural bone. So this little bit of cortical bone that's been mobilized will not be replaced as long as estrogen levels are high. That is, the structural bone, cortical bone, won't be replaced until the hen goes out of lay, until she goes through a mold. Now, the medullary bone that's mobilized can be replaced, but it doesn't always get put back in the same place. So it might be mobilized from this nice, lovely bit of medullary bone that's protecting the cortical bone surface, but when it's redeposited, it might be redeposited over in the upper right-hand corner of this image. And over time, uh, we see that medullary bone that initially provides a nice, fairly, fairly thick, not perfect, but fairly thick uh, layer of protection of the cortical bone gets mobilized and deposited somewhere else. And over time, we see that medullary bone becoming more diffuse and offering less protection to the structural bone. Okay, so now let's put this in the context of a 24-hour egg production cycle. So the 24 hours that it takes to produce a single egg. So if we look at this graph on the y-axis, we've got the amount of shell mineral that's deposited, and on the x-axis, the hours of ovulation. Okay, so let's, let's put some arbitrary time. Well, let me, let me define this. So uh, for about the first four hours of the egg production cycle, there's almost no calcium being deposited into the egg uh, because the egg has not reached the shell gland yet. After about four hours in the oviduct, the egg is now in the shell gland and eggshell deposition is gradually deposited. Uh, the rate of deposition increases until that egg is ready to be laid. And then the cycle starts all over again. So let's, let's put some arbitrary times on here. So let's say that the hen lays an egg at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And there's about a 30 minute window between one oviposition, one egg being laid, and the next ovulation, the release of the follicle from the ovary. So there's really a very short, uh, well, a very small amount of time during which calcium is deposited onto the shell gland before the lights go out. 
Okay, most of the calcium deposition occurs while the lights are out in the dark period. Okay, six o'clock in the morning, the lights come on, the hen can start eating, and so this last little bit of calcium, uh, she can actually have calcium coming from the digestive tract to support eggshell formation. Now, the the feed that a hen consumes prior to the lights going off usually takes about four to six hours to uh, completely pass through the digestive tract. So what that means is if we simply feed the birds, um, well, if the birds have a meal right before the lights go off, there's probably a four hour period. And that period is where much of the calcium deposition is taking place, uh, where there's no calcium coming from the diet. So that calcium has to come from the bone. Now, perfect, in a perfect situation, that calcium would come only from the medullary bone but the reality is probably a large proportion comes from the medullary bone, but some of it comes from the structural bone. Okay. Now, again, lights come on, the hen eats, the hen is consuming calcium, absorbing calcium from the gut. That calcium can be taken by the blood to the shell gland for bone deposition. The egg is laid, and then we repeat uh, the cycle over again. So we come back to the left-hand side of the graph. And for this brief period after the egg is laid, and while there's really not very much uh, egg, well, there's no eggshell formation taking place and the hen is consuming feed that she can replace the medullary bone. Okay, so this happens day in, day out for 65 weeks, 72 weeks, 100 weeks, 120 weeks. So over time, there's a gradual loss of structural bone, even as the medullary bone keeps getting replaced. And in fact, even as the medullary bone might increase, uh, in, in volume. Okay, so how does this relate to egg formation, uh, eggshell quality? Well, there have been a number of studies that have shown that the proportion of calcium in the shell that comes directly from the diet influences the quality of the eggshell. So sort of on average, in, under typical circumstances, about 60 to 80% of the calcium in the eggshell comes directly from the diet on those eggshell forming days. Now, what the researchers also found was that the greater the proportion of eggshell calcium that came directly from the diet, so if we're more on that 80% dietary calcium, uh, the better the shell quality is. Okay, so the more the hens rely on bone calcium supply, the poorer the quality of the eggshell. Okay, so Essentially, what that's telling us is the things that we do to optimize shell quality are probably also going to be the same things that optimize bone quality. And bone quality, particularly in long production cycles, becomes an important limiting factor to being able to keep that flock as long as possible. Okay, so, so remember this graph that I showed you. Uh, remember that there's a period where bone both structural and medullary bone is going to be mobilized. And there's also a period where only medullary bone is, uh, is going to be deposited. Now, what if we could find a way to have that calcium stay in the gut for a longer period of time so that in effect, we could take this sort of red bar and make it smaller so that there's a, a longer period of time during the dark period uh, where calcium is in fact coming from the digestive tract directly. Okay, one of the ways that we can do that is we can feed a, a combination of large particle and small particle calcium sources. So those larger particles, um, people usually ask what is large? Uh, I would say larger than one millimeter. Um, if you can do four millimeters, that's, that's ideal. Um, the challenge is that at four millimeters, you're basically pulling rocks through your feeding system, so that, that can be a challenge. But the, the principle is these larger particles that are longer uh, take longer to, to break down, take longer to release, to be dissolved and release the calcium to the gut, they stay in the gizzard for a longer period of time. The gizzard holds them. Uh, if you've ever opened up a gizzard and seen uh, uh, the, the grit there or the, the large particle calcium, that's what's happening. The, the gizzard hangs onto it, it the, the, those large particles are gradually ground down, they're gradually released over a long period during the dark cycle. Uh, 
and then we reduce the amount of time that the hen has to rely on bone calcium mobilization. We reduce the amount of bone calcium that has to be used to support eggshell formation. Now, it's important that we also have small particle calcium because in the morning, when the lights come on and the hens start eating, we want that small particle calcium that's readily dissolved and rapidly absorbed to be available to start supporting eggshell formation in the early hours of the morning and support eggshell formation until that egg is, is laid. Okay, um, what can you do if you notice, uh, start to notice a shell quality problem? Um, there are a couple of things in an emergency, you can top dress the feed with, with something like oyster shell or large particle calcium carbonate. Um, this of course is, requires a lot of labor depending on your uh, operation, depending on your um, facilities, depending on your, your labor supply might not be practical. Uh, one of the things in a, uh, an extensively housed operation is you can make calcium available free choice um, and allow the birds to consume calcium uh, at will. Basically, if the hens need calcium, they, uh, uh, they will consume calcium. And, and I mentioned Nella Batras uh, earlier. Um, she is in the process of um, finishing up her thesis and she's got uh, a paper that we hope will be coming out uh, in the next little while, uh, looking at um, calcium appetite of, uh, of laying hens. So um, that, uh, that is, uh, yeah, hopefully coming out soon. But we know laying hens have a, a calcium appetite um, and they will regulate their calcium intake. I don't worry about birds overeating on calcium. Okay, what's another way that we can get some, some calcium uh, being absorbed from the gut during the middle of the night? Um, I am a believer in midnight feeding. I don't think it's always required. I think it's a tool that we can use if we uh, think we're having a problem or if we anticipate having a problem. And so the idea is that we allow access to feed for one hour, um, perhaps two, certainly no more than two, uh, but for one hour in the middle of the night. So we turn the lights on, we run the feed lines, uh, the birds learn that they can consume feed um, for that period during the night. It replenishes the calcium coming from the digestive tract. Um, and again, it, it reduces the reliance on bone calcium uh, in order to supply um, uh, eggshell. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got sufficient number of hours before midnight feeding and after midnight feeding. Um, and if we do that, uh, the birds don't appear to perceive that as the start of a new day. Uh, this is an experiment we did. It had nothing to do initially with midnight feeding. Uh, our birds were producing really well, and we started to see shell quality problems showing up as a loss of, of hen day production. We started midnight feeding, and almost immediately our egg production uh, went up again. In reality, what happened, we, we stopped losing shellless eggs. Uh, and so our, our apparent egg production came back up in response to this midnight feeding. We also, um, it may not be as much of an issue in Alberta, but uh, midnight feeding also has benefits in hot environments uh, because it allows the birds to shift some of their heat increment to the, the warmer part of the day. Um, just a, a word of caution, if you're going to start midnight feeding, the birds learn to anticipate that that meal being uh, available in the middle of the night. So midnight feeding is not something you stop and start and stop and start. Um, if you're going to use midnight feeding, I would say start it and continue doing it because otherwise you uh, have potential problems if suddenly the birds don't get uh, their, their midnight meal. Uh, we've done some work with, uh, with 25 hydroxy D3. Um, this is from an experiment where we looked at, uh, this is an older experiment, but we looked at Highline W36 sort of a traditional strain, uh, and W98s, which were an early maturing strain. Um, and these early maturing birds tended to have more problems with shell quality and bone, uh, bone quality as well. So we looked at bone quality at the end of the production cycle in birds from each strain fed either vitamin D or 25-hydroxy vitamin D. When we looked at cortical bone, uh, we saw a strain difference, but we saw no effect of the 25-hydroxy D3 within either strain. But what was really interesting is that in both strains, we saw a reduction in medullary bone density. Now, I mean, typically when we think of bone quality, 
we think of a reduction in density as being a bad thing. Well, remember that medullary bone is not a structural bone tissue. It's meant to support eggshell formation. And so we saw this, this decrease in the density of medullary bone, no difference in cortical bone when we fed 25-hydroxy-D3, and that resulted in a decrease in defective shells in both strains when we fed 25-hydroxy-D3. So um, in our experiments, in, in this experiment, um, we were able to collect every single egg, whether it had a shell or not, so we could identify all the eggs that were laid, shellless or not, um, and when we fed 25-hydroxy-D3, <clears throat> excuse me, saw a decrease in defective shells. And there was no uh, decrease in overall egg numbers. Again, good shells plus defective shells. So uh, in reality, what we saw here was an increase in the amount of saleable eggs. Uh, this is some work that uh, my, my master's student, Felipe Silva, did in Colombia in a commercial egg operation. Uh, basically, what we did was we compared feeding 25-hydroxy-D3 for varying lengths of time. Um, so our positive control had 25-hydroxy-D3 for the entire production cycle up to uh, 87 weeks of age, I believe. Negative control just had vitamin D. Uh, and then early prelay peak and late were birds that were fed 25-hydroxy-D3 up until various points. So early was zero to 15 weeks of age, prelay zero to 17 weeks of age, peak zero to 31 and late zero to 41 weeks of age uh, that the birds were fed, um, that the birds were fed 25 hydroxy D3 and then switched to uh, the vitamin D. So a couple of things I'll point out. First of all is that um, compared to the negative control, early production was higher in all uh, all of the birds um, that were fed 25 hydroxy D3 for at least part of the pullet phase. Uh, if we look at um, the individual treatments, so this is egg production to 34 weeks of age. The birds that were only fed vitamin D uh, had lower production than the, the positive control and also uh, the, the peak birds. So those birds would have been uh, the PC, the peak, and late. Um, birds would have been on 25 hydroxy D3 for most or all of this, uh, this uh, part of the production cycle. Looking at overall egg production, what we found was that um, when birds were fed either no 25 hydroxy D3 or to 15 or 17 weeks of age only, we saw a reduction in egg, uh, re reduction in egg numbers to 87 weeks of age. Um, and interestingly, um, feeding 25 hydroxy D3 to 30 weeks of age, so not even for the full uh, production cycle, resulted in the highest level of egg production. Uh, so, whoops. so if we um, look at shell quality, uh, again, positive control and most of the 25-hydroxy um, D3 treatments had increased or improved shell quality relative to birds that were only fed vitamin D. And if we look at different periods, uh, contrasting birds that were fed 25-hydroxy D3 versus the negative control, um, which changes, of course, at different time periods. Uh, we see particularly late in production, so 53 to 75, 77 to 87, and, and even over the entire production cycle, uh, the positive control with 25-hydroxy D3 performed better in terms of shell quality than the negative control, and the effect was most strongly seen at the end of production. I mentioned there's a positive relationship between bone quality and shell quality, uh, and what we found was, again, if we looked at um, the positive control versus negative control, significantly better egg, uh, sorry, shell, sorry, bone strength uh, at 90 weeks of age when birds are fed 25 hydroxy D3 compared to only vitamin D. And interestingly, um, and if you, you've heard my talks before, I talk about the importance of pullet rearing. Um, in terms of bone strength, the treatment with the strongest bones at 90 weeks of age were actually the birds that were fed. Um, 25 hydroxy D3 for 15 weeks during the pullet phase. So even after we took 25 hydroxy D3 out of the diet for the entire production cycle, um, still a positive impact on uh, bone strength. Okay, what else can uh, impact uh, bone strength and shell quality? 
uh, we talked about the importance of calcium supply. And of course, that implies that the calcium that we provide is going to be absorbed from the gut. Uh, so this is some data from, from Rob Renema. Many of you know Rob from uh, his involvement at the university for many years and now uh, in the broiler industry with the Alberta chicken producers. Uh, but he did some really interesting work looking at fat quality. Uh, so he fed um, layers, uh, diet containing fresh canola oil, high quality canola oil, or oil that had been oxidized. So oxidatively damaged uh, oil, perhaps like we would see from uh, restaurant grease, from deep fat, deep fat fryer oils, uh, and so on. Uh, and basically what he saw was a negative impact on the structure and function of the intestine, which substantially reduced calcium uptake. So poor quality fat can have a negative impact on calcium uh, uptake. Uh, looking at heat stress, again, um, maybe not so much a problem in Alberta as it is in Southeast Asia or Latin America. Um, but when the birds are heat stressed, we want to do what we can to minimize that heat stress through environmental management, if possible, um, ventilation and, uh, and, and uh, other um, uh, engineering uh, approaches. One of the things that we can do from a, a dietary standpoint is uh, we, can, um, we can replace some of the, the sodium chloride with sodium bicarbonate. And the reason that we do this is when birds are hot, they cool themselves off by panting. When they pant, they increase their respiration rate. And when they re increase their respiration rate, they actually drive off more carbon dioxide. Now, that carbon dioxide does a couple of things in the body. It's not just a waste product. It's part of the blood buffering system. So the bicarbonate in the blood helps to maintain a normal blood pH. When the bird drives off a lot of carbon dioxide, blood pH tends to increase. And that increase in pH tends to um, reduce the ability of the hen to form a high quality shell. So it affects the ability of the shell gland to make shell material. The other consequence is that calcium carbonate, which makes up the shell, the carbonate part of calcium carbonate comes from bicarbonate, which comes from carbon dioxide. So there's really two ways that um, panting can decrease shell quality. Now, if we replace some of the sodium chloride with sodium bicarbonate, uh, we help to maintain that buffering capacity uh, and still provide the hens with the sodium that they need. Now, we talked about midnight feeding, and it's something that, that can be implemented very rapidly in response to a sudden drop in shell quality or sudden drop in egg production caused by uh, a lack of calcium getting to the shell gland. One other thing that uh, is, is possible to use um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it and then I'll give some warning, um, is water supplementation of calcium. It is possible to add calcium to the, to the water to deliver calcium to the hens. So uh, basically when the hens are drinking water, they're also consuming calcium. Now there's a couple of reasons why I uh, recommend caution with this. I mentioned that laying hens have an appetite for calcium and you probably will have noticed that some hens will pick through uh, the feed and either select or uh, exclude large particle calcium depending on their needs. Well, if we're providing calcium in the water and it's a substantial proportion of their calcium in the water, what we find is that they don't regulate or they can't regulate their calcium intake. The other thing is a practical uh, impact. So uh, over the long term, calcium can build up on nipple drinker valves, it can build up in pipes, uh, can actually um, cause problems um, over time. So this can be effective, but it's something that it, it really is a short-term solution while you perhaps sort out other things to address the issue. Okay, in general, we've talked about starting strong. We've talked about start with the end in mind. We've talked about all the things that we need to do in order to maintain high levels of production for long periods of time. I am a firm believer that preventing problems from happening as much as we possibly can is far better than trying to cure a problem. So when we prevent things, it allows bird to maintain high levels of productivity, bird health and shell quality. When we go in and try and cure something or fix something, um, we usually are trying to recover lost performance or lost health or lost birds, and that can be very difficult. So 
do whatever you can to manage the birds to avoid problems in the first place. And often cheap solutions end up costing you more money over the life of the flock. Okay, so if you identify a problem that exists, you have to develop realistic expectations. Can the damage be overcome? Um, small problems caught early are usually easier to fix than big problems. Discovering the problem sooner is more likely to lead to correction than discovering the problems later. And if we have lots and lots of little problems, particularly with long production cycles, we can really run into issues uh, with all those little problems adding up to reduce uh, our problems. Okay, so I just wanna give you some concepts. Um, what's realistic to expect? So this first, uh, this first line is, this is the management guide target. This is what we want our flock to uh, achieve to, in this case, 95 weeks of age. Well, what happens if we have underweight pullets? They're gonna come in. They might produce okay. The, the, the production curve might parallel, uh, parallel the, the egg production uh, target, but they never really reach production. We probably can't fix that problem because small birds coming into production are gonna remain small birds uh, throughout production. They're gonna lay small eggs. They're gonna lay fewer eggs, okay? So that's a problem we can't fix once the birds are in the barn. Uh, what happens if there's an uncorrected problem? Well, birds might start out producing quite well. There's a problem and by the time we notice it, there's just no way to recover from it. We're gonna have to accept um, a lower production throughout the, the life of the flock. We're probably gonna end up depopulating this flock much earlier and have to replace them. Now, sometimes, and I showed you that an example, uh, showed you an example of that when we um, used midnight feeding to correct a shell quality problem. Sometimes, but not often, if you identify the problem and it's fixable and can deal with it very quickly, you lose a little bit of production, but you can bring birds back up and um, uh, maintain a, a good production. In the meantime, you've lost this amount of production. But again, you have to be realistic in your expectations of what can be overcome and to what degree can you recover from a problem. So best case scenario, avoid all problems, do the best that you can to, to minimize those, those problems from happening. Okay, so success in long production cycles, and, and even if we consider long uh, for Alberta, um, what would be typical in Alberta, regardless, it starts with the pullet. Shell quality is often the limiting factor for extended laying cycles, and we can improve shell quality, and not only shell quality, but bone quality, uh, if we reduce the reliance of the hen on bone calcium to support eggshell formation. And prevention is far more effective than reaction. If you can plan and manage and execute your management so that there are as few problems as possible, you're on top of things, so you identify problems as they occur and fix them as quickly as possible, that's how you're going to be able to sustain high levels of egg production in your laying flock. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I realize I went a little bit long, but this is something that I'm really passionate about, and uh, I hope that uh, I hope that we can have a good discussion. So thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, we do have a few questions coming in, and if you have any questions, you just go to the Q and A uh, uh, box down at the bottom there. You can either upvote a question that's already been uh, put out there, or uh, put, put your own uh, question in there. So um, Dr. Cormer has time till about 12.15. Um, so we'll take a few questions and then uh, we'll have to wrap up. So thank you, Doug, for, for that presentation. Let's, uh, let's have a peek at those questions. Um, why do you think you saw a decrease in medullar bone when high D was fed? That's a great question and one we haven't figured out yet. Um, if I look at, at the outcome, what I would say is that through some mechanism, um, the, uh, the, the birds fed 25 hydroxy D3 were better able to use the medullary bone. Um, I think what it might be is that there was less mobilization and deposition and mobilization and deposition because the more of that that happens, the more quickly the medullary bone becomes diffuse and it doesn't protect. So if if 25 hydroxy D3 increases, for example, calcium supply from the gut, um, reduces the need to mobilize bone, it may be 
that the um, that protective layer of medullary bone stays in place longer. And when it is used, it's sort of mobilized from the outside, really the inside of the bone. So we think of the bone shell like, like this. Uh, medullary bone is deposited on the inside. So the osteoclasts are working their way out and they have to get through more medullary bone. So um, it, it probably is a balance of needing or, or yeah, needing to mobilize less medullary or less bone in general. Um, and then when that bone is mobilized, it's more likely to be medullary bone than cortical bone. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, so you talked uh, a little bit about liquid calcium. Is, is that the, I mean, you, you cautioned us about liquid calcium and you said, you know, there are times when you might have to use it yeah. uh, until you get your other ducks in a row, <laughs> to your other programs. But this yeah. is specifically about bone repair in a laying hen. Yeah, so um, I, I get this question all the time. And the sad reality is when that hen loses structural bone, she's not gaining it back until she goes through a molt. Um, and the whole point with these long production cycles is that molting is no longer necessary. Um, so, you know, in Canada, we, we haven't molted um, our birds. Uh, but this is why identifying problems sooner is critical because if you say, oh, my birds are 80 weeks of age and I'm noticing a lot of broken bones, that is not the time to go in and say, okay, what can I feed to fix all those weak bones? Because unless you put those birds through a molt or unless they naturally go through a molt, they just say, I'm out of calcium, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. They go through a molt, come back in. So you cannot repair structural bone halfway through. You have to maintain it. You have to feed the birds to minimize the use of structural bone. And, um, and yeah, so I can't recommend anything to fix those problems because it's just the physiology doesn't allow it. Now, if you start to notice problems, um, you can, you might have lost a little bit of production, but then you can do what you need to do to keep those birds producing at a high level, maybe a little bit lower than your, your target persistency. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's too late when you're running into massive problems to say, okay, now what can I feed to fix it? Yeah, for sure. As we talk about these, you know, the potential for longer, uh, uh, longer cycles, your story about start with the end in mind becomes even more and more important. So thanks for that. Um, question here, you mentioned calcium particle size, although it's a good starting point, but wouldn't calcium solubility of, or of different sources uh, be something better to, to consider? Um, most times coarser calcium solubilizes slower than, uh, but that isn't always the case depending on where the calcium comes from. So sorry, I, I did a terrible job reading that. No, that, that, that's, that's fine. Um, it's exactly right. Now, in general, our assumptions are that larger particle takes longer to dissolve in the gut than smaller particle. Um, the, the question is absolutely right. Depending on where you get your limestone, where you get your large particle calcium, um, there's huge variation in the rate of solubility. Um, so it's important not only to say, well, I've got the right particle size, um, but understand the rate of solubilization. Um, Many of you know Rosalina Unhel from the University of Maryland. Uh, she, she has spent a lot of time looking at limestones from all over the world. And even within a country, different mines have limestones with different solubility. So it, you can't even say, well, you know, Canadian limestone is like this and, and European limestone is like that. So um, I didn't have time to talk about it. I recognize it as an issue, but yes, the main thing is understanding what do you need to do to provide a slow release calcium from the gizzard that's going to over hours in the dark period at night um, be released to provide calcium to the shell gland? Okay, uh, question here about how could you fix sandy or rough eggshells? Yeah, we're starting to get a little bit out of my area of expertise. Um, sometimes th those um, Sometimes those, those eggshell uh, defects can be related to an excessive supply of calcium, um, but there are other factors and, and I'm gonna 
make myself, uh, I'm going to embarrass myself pretty quickly if I start to get into too much. It's, it's not really something that uh, we've looked a lot at. So uh, there are some resources out there. I know, um, help me, what is her name? Juliet uh, Roberts. Juliet Roberts uh, from Australia uh, has developed some great resources. So if you are able to maybe even uh, Google that, uh, she uh, that might be some some help for you in that regard. So yeah, and, and some of you may have uh, it's the Egg Quality Handbook. Um, a new version is just uh, I believe it comes out of Japan. Um, a new version has just come out. I haven't had a chance to take a look at the new version, but I know the old version does talk about some of those uh, shell quality issues as well. Oh, perfect. So there's a couple of resources for you as well. Uh, folks, I'll just remind you, if you wouldn't mind, please put your questions in the question and answer box. We have a couple in the chat. So there's one here. Uh, Doug, according to you, what would be the best nutritional tool to use continuously or one week per month, rearing and laying periods, for supporting any intestinal integrity, integrity for guaranteeing as much as possible high intestinal nutrient mineral absorption. So it's about gut integrity, mineral absorption. Right. So, so the question, the question is asking for a specific recommendation. I'm going to give a general one. Um, so the, the concept is, um, so I talked about fat quality. Um, oxidized fat can damage the intestinal absorptive surfaces. Okay, so that's one way that calcium absorption is impaired is when the intestine isn't functioning properly. Now, there are other things that can impair the function of the intestine, including microbial, uh, the, the microbiome. So if there are pathogens present, if there are high bacterial numbers uh, present, if there are mycotoxins present. Um, so gut health is this big concept. We wanna do everything that we can to maintain good gut health. Um, and so um, in Canada, we wouldn't typically use antibiotics. Um, there are countries where antibiotics are used, uh, but basically anything that we can do, and I'm not recommending antibiotics, I wanna be clear about that, um, but what we can do to, to manage gut health. So there are different products that work in different situations and every farm is different. Every farm has different challenges. So the, the product that works best for, um, the, the microbial challenges on one farm are not going to be the same products that work well for the mycotoxin challenges on a different farm. So understand what the challenge is and understand what you can do to maintain gut health. Um, I think this is going to be particularly in North America as we move um, to extensive housing where birds have more access to, um, to fecal material uh, we're going to have to deal with coccidiosis and necrotic enteritis that we haven't had to, to deal with before. And obviously, we're not going to have coccidiostats and um, uh, antibiotics mm -hmm. like we had in the broiler industry, for example. So I, I know it's asking for a specific recommendation, um, but again, it's, it's context dependent. What, is, what are the challenges on your farm? Is it a water quality qu uh, problem? So high sulfates can cause uh, diarrhea. So, you know, adding a probiotic isn't necessarily going to fix high sulfate water. So, um, but yeah, the, the question is really good from the standpoint of stressing how important gut health is. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, and I, you know, we talk about gut health, it's two simple words that roll off our tongue, but there are so many factors that contribute to it. So though it's a, it's a general answer, I think it really gives us a clue of some of the things we need to look at, right? You mentioned uh, water quality and um, mycotoxins, all of those things. And so what happened in the last flock might be a different situation in this flock, even on the same farm. So good answer. Um, question here about how can split feeding affect calcium metabolism and blood calcium dynamic? Yeah, great question. And I think it's one that industry is starting to try and wrap its head around. Um, so split feeding is this idea that um, you feed calcium uh, or a high calcium diet when the birds actually need a high calcium diet. So when they're forming an eggshell, particularly early in the morning, um, when they're forming the albumin, um, you feed a higher protein diet. So later, uh, you know, after, you know, mid morning to early, early afternoon, um, and, and different approaches might change that, um, that split. But basically it's two different diets. One, a higher calcium diet to support eggshell formation, one, a higher protein diet, higher amino acid diet. Uh, 
to support albumin formation. In theory, it works great. Um, I haven't done any work with it myself, um, but the question is, not every bird in the flock is laying at exactly the same time. So how much, you know, I, I suppose if you get, get it right and the majority of the hens are getting exactly what they need, that's gonna increase shell quality for those birds, but is it gonna impair shell quality because you've got some hens that are still forming an eggshell uh, when they get switched to their high protein diet. So um, as I said, I haven't done any work. I think it's a really intriguing possibility. Um, and I think it might also, um, yeah, help to, to help us feed calcium more efficiently. And I talked a little bit about this in my last webinar, but the relationship between calcium and phosphorus, and that's where the money uh, is to be saved or made, is getting the calcium and phosphorus right from a phosphorus standpoint. Yeah, very interesting, though. I think, you know, you also talked about top dressing and uh, with, with uh, calcium and that and, and the uh, uh, hen's ability to be able to pick out whatever she needs um, to, you know, for, for where she is in her, her cycle. So I think, you know, that might be the safer route to go in some ways until we know a little bit more about flip feeding. Um, you know, she can kind of identify what she needs. Um, I have a, a couple questions about, you know, you talked about the high D and the, the value of feeding it um, from an early point while those birds are, are through rearing and, and into about 30 weeks of age. Have you done any um, economic analysis on that, looking at like uh, how much it costs and do you, you know, you recoup that in the production that you get um, because of better shell quality? Yeah, we haven't done any of those economic analyses in, in our um, in our uh, experiments. Um, I will say with the, with the uh, field trial that we did with a commercial producer in Colombia, um, and, and this was over, I believe we had 5 million hens in our study. So this is fairly large operations. Um, I wasn't privy to their economic analysis, but their economic analysis showed a positive return on investment. So. Um, okay. We'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm, yeah. I'm teasing. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to know because we do, you know, one flock at a time. So unless you can do as you described, where you're looking at multiple flocks, um, it, it's uh, difficult to to do that kind of analysis. Um, um, now, one one thing I need to clarify. I, I mentioned Nella Batras as uh, talking about the extended production cycles. Uh, when I was talking about the calcium appetite, it was actually Gianna Sucaveras, uh, a visiting student from Brazil. So I want to make sure that I, I get that right. Oh, okay, good. Give credit where credit is due, exactly. for sure. 